Ocular by Iniquity. Chapter 10. He was resolved now to the matter that he had completely lost his sense of time. Sleeping came so naturally that not even the sharp winter sun could keep him awake. This was a great contrast to his usual self, where not even the dark, cold night could force him to sleep. He did not know how long he had watched Lawrence at his desk. He was laying down when he woke up, which would not have confused him as much had it been Lawrence at his side. But he was alone in their cocoon. There was no Lawrence and no sounds that might have indicated Lawrence was here. Someone was writing, but it was not Lawrence. He could identify the sound of Lawrence's pen on paper. The light filtering into his blankets and the sound of the camp told him it was midday. He longed to be a part of it, but it seemed like such a great effort. Not to mention that the warmth of his many blankets seemed almost too marvelous to hide from, and of course that he had told Lawrence that he would stay in the tent. He peeked his head outside the blankets. Burr? He said, a frown grazing his lips. Hello, Hamilton, Burr said from Lawrence's chair where he was writing on Lawrence's desk. Admittedly, I would have expected Lawrence or Lafayette before you, Alexander said, managing to sit himself up properly with what seemed like a reasonable effort. That at least was good. Recognizing only after how bad his words sounded, he quickly added, Though it is good to see you, of course. It has been some time, has it not? You are not busy with command? Are you to fight? I know it is a disappointment to you to only see me, Burr said with a teasing little smile. But it is good to see you as well. It's hard to establish how closely the gossip of the camp actually reflects reality. You seem better than the talk. That's good. Regarding the rest of your entourage, they were both indisposed by battle preparations. The Marquise remembered that we were acquainted and came to retrieve me to nursemaid you from leaving your tent and walking into this devil gold. As for my command, my men are already ready. You make a good leader, Burr. And you a marvelous aide-de-camp, or so I have heard. Alexander snorted in disdain, but somehow it felt like too much effort to rehash the argument. So, he said instead, my fever is common gossip? Only second to the battle, I think. The man paused, considering. Perhaps the only other illness that could get more attention would be General Washington himself. Or maybe the Marquis. I did not know so many were aware. Well, you did make a marvelous attempt to destroy the medical tent. And as I am sure you have now learned, there is little for sick men to do other than talk. I did not doubt it for a second when I heard the story. Burr smiled and shifted in his seat. It seems truly Hamiltonian in its telling. The man pouches out mid-march only to be rescued by the Marquis de Lafayette. General Washington immediately orders the medical tent to be built, first to attend to this man. Upon his waking, Hamilton nearly topples the tent and disturbs all the men inside, in an attempt to resume working when, in fact, he is not even capable of standing or speaking outside of a drunken slur. Bert cast him an amused, familiar glance. I dare say one could not conjure a story that speaks more to your character in their greatest attempt. I hope I am not being mocked for being aware of the work that needs to be done, Alexander said with a frown. I will never make light of your incredibly intensive work ethic, though I cannot speak for any man but myself. Burr sighed and cast an eye at his as finished letter due to the man's tendency to not speak about things. The more important, the less one tended to know, Alexander could not guess what it was about. He could have been working, or he could have been sending a letter to this woman he was rumored to be courting. Despite that I know I am wasting my time and breath, I would ask as your friend that you consider pulling back from the upcoming battle, on account of your poor health. Alexander frowned. While it was no surprise to him that Burr was seeking the safest and least offensive way to handle the upcoming days, the last thing he currently desired was another man to hound him about his health. My health is improving, he said sharply. I have even managed to sit on my own, as you can see. And you know as well as I do that without that experience, Washington will never give me the command I deserve. I am sure that the British will be astonished to hear that you can sit. Certainly that is all that is required of deadly combat. No frown drew itself across the other man's lips, but the tone of his voice was enough that Alexander scowled. 
I also imagine the general understands you would be an extraordinary commander of men, because being extraordinary is what you do. Perhaps he merely does not think that post will be as valuable as the one you currently possess. How can he see more value in this? Alexander gestured to the papers everywhere in the tent. Then leading men on the battlefield! Burr shrugged. A strong arm is nothing without a brain to command it, and a solid link between the two. None of those three elements is effective without the other. Spoken by the man who has the honor and privilege to be the arm, Alexander muttered, who is permitted, nay, encouraged, to make something great of himself, who is not treated like some glorified secretary, and even less than that currently, who does not suffer due to his excellency's misguided feelings as if I am some wayward son washed upon the beaches. Burr cleared his throat, cutting the beginning of Alexander's rant off. Only you would be upset that the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army has a vested interest in you living. Alexander shifted his blankets around him and gazed solidly up at the other man. Being shepherded and nursemaided is not the way to create glory and station for oneself. This is my only chance. To be hugged back shames me. Burr rolled his eyes. At least in lieu of you growing a sense of self-preservation, which seems hopelessly impossible, your entourage exists. I still think that you should go home when you are well enough to travel. I won't. No, for I would wonder what had happened to the man who practically accosted me in New York otherwise. He said dryly. Well, it is not my fault you bought the man who accosted you a drink, Alexander retorted. Plus, it is impossible for me to die now. I promised Lawrence not to die, and I am not a man who break a promise. Burr's eyebrows went up and looked at Alexander for a long moment. His gaze was piercing like a spear. No one looked at him the way Burr managed to do so seemingly from that first fateful day. The closest he could think of was Lawrence. But Lawrence gazed at him like an encompassing embrace, like a caress. And Burr looked at him like the darkness of the barrel of a pistol. I should promise my Theodosia not to die. He finally said, his gaze returning to his letter. You certainly should, Alexander replied. Burr opened his mouth to say something else, but both of their attentions were drawn by Lafayette stepping through the tent flaps. Bonjour, mes amis, he said, bowing to the both of them. Thank you, Burr, for looking after Hamilton for me. If you have other duties, please feel free to attend to them, although, of course, you are welcome to stay by the grace of the tent's owner. His eyes moved to Hamilton, who shrugged. I trust he has not driven you mad yet. If he has not managed to drive me mad yet, some barely manageable fever should have no effect. He seems to be improving, though, so I have complete confidence. We will soon see him talking the general's ear off in the future. He collected his unfinished letter and rolled it up, studying Hamilton again. There was a moment, and then he stood. I do have other tasks to attend to, but it is my pleasure to look after him if you and the lieutenant colonel are indisposed. Please do not hesitate to seek me out if my services are required. Thank you, sir. You are dismissed. Lafayette wore an easy smile despite the formality. Burr saluted. I'll see you on the other side of the battle, Hamilton. Burr said over his shoulder and departed. He has never struck me as your kind of fellow, if I can be so frank as to say so. Lafayette said in French. Alexander studied the other man. There was a vibrating kind of energy to him that had not been there before, and his eyes were bright with excitement, despite the evident tiredness there. He moved with an erratic kind of quickness, standing and pacing around the small tent, avoiding the messes of paper only with some difficulty. Curiously enough, he was also wearing his rucksack, which seemed odd if this was only a social visit. He was my first friend at the time this land was as foreign to me as I'm sure it was to you. And while I may disagree with the things he does not say, I would not hesitate to protect his character. Alexander replied a little pointedly in English. He waved off the beginning of Lafayette's apology, eyes following the man's pack as he set it down. It is good you have managed to sit, Lafayette said after a moment. He also glanced at the bag and offered a mysterious little smile. I will now render my official verdict. You have improved greatly. I will make a full recovery. Do not make a liar of me. Alexander found his curiosity piqued. Never, my friend. Have you brought me a gift? 
if you are lucky, you will soon be able to senselessly charge into your own death, and I will not even have to catch you. The grin slipped into a scowl, though he could not decide if he was more annoyed at the Frenchman's dismissal of his question or his health. But to discuss why you should not go to battle is not why I came. Lafayette continued, his voice now growing in excitement. He finally managed to sit in Lawrence's chair and leaned in as if to share a conspiracy. I have a secret that much never reached the general's ears. If you promise not to speak of it in untrusted company, I shall share with you a great treasure. I will take this secret to my grave. Alexander could not help his curiosity, but he could not keep a note of confusion from his voice. I swore on my mother's passing. It shall be so. Well, a wide, thrilled grin spread across the Frenchman's face as he pulled his shoulders back and puffed his chest. I have procured a feast. From his rucksack, he pulled two apples, a small bottle of port, two chicken legs, and a wedge of cheese. Alexander's eyes went wide. He had not seen such food in an eternity or before then. Lafayette suppressed a laugh at whatever was going to come next and leaned in even closer so he could whisper in Alexander's ear. It cannot be helped that General Lee is a man who cannot pay attention to his own officer's meal. Certainly such riches can be used more appropriately to power the men who actually provide some worth to our cause. A sharp laugh escaped Alexander before he rustled his emotions back under control at Lafayette's glare. Neither of them liked the other general, and Alexander found him to be a pompous, dull bore on the best nights, and an obnoxious, vapid lout at worst. He had no issue at all reaching for one of the stolen chicken legs and biting into it. It was cold, but not frozen, and it tasted as if God himself had brought such a marvelous gift. Have you told Lawrence? He said, mouth stuffed in a similarly conspiratorial French whisper. Certainly he should enjoy the fruits of your deceptive and cunning labor. Yes, he took an apple, but insisted on you having the rest. Please eat. We cannot share. I am not hungry. Alexander knew it to be a lie, because there was not a man to their cause that was not hungry. But he could not help himself. He inhaled the first chicken leg, ate half the cheese in one bite, and then started on the second without another word. Lafayette, meanwhile, had procured a small knife and was cutting one apple into small sections, which he sent onto a blank piece of paper. There was the satisfying silence of men enjoying their meal. Alexander pondered his own thoughts as he ate the apple pieces that were appearing in front of him. Lafayette, he found his voice to have an unfamiliar insecurity as he spoke, disturbing their peace. Lafayette noticed it as well, for the man looked up at him and frowned in concern. May I ask you something in confidence, as you have asked me? I know you to be a close friend of mine, and I seek your opinion on valuable matters. It is my great honor to provide you with all the wisdom I have acquired, Lafayette replied. I will speak to you as honest as I may be, and in full confidence I will not rediscuss our matters even with your esteemed Lawrence. Do you? He ran through the words in his head as he took another bite of chicken. Do you think a man could love another man as a man loves a woman? Not just in the matters of the physical being, but the soul? I do think that you are in love with Lawrence. Yes, Lafayette said without skipping a beat. Alexander's jaw dropped. I did not wish to see how well you could chew your food, Hamilton. The Frenchman added as if he not fired a rifle directly into Alexander's chest. Was it so obvious? Was it so clear that it was merely a matter of time before he was executed? Had he made some clear and obvious indication or some particular action? Was it come and gossip like his fever? How am I by get down? Should he see to ending himself with his illness as to avoid the humiliation of the gallows? That... He started because there was no reasonable action other than to deny... He was merely proposing a thought experiment. He was considering what could be in an extreme situation of the human condition. This did not in any way reflect any sort of experience he had actually had. He could not risk being so transparent. You overestimate your boundaries, my friend, he managed sharply. 
Lafayette studied him, intense but even. I will willingly blind myself to what I view, if that is desired, but I will not apologize for seeing with open eyes. His voice was steady and his gaze was unafraid. I do not speak so in jest or in shame or to accuse you of some terrible ill or misgiving, nor would I say so if I did not have ultimate confidence in what I saw. And if I am mistaken, rebuke me in your way that you have rebuked others, but do so only if that is the feeling in your heart, and not for the sake of appearances or for some law that, like many, is unjust. Alexander could see he was waiting for a tongue lashing. All he had was silence. I think it must be so, he said after a long moment in a quiet voice. It seemed absurd to hide under such circumstances. To feign ignorance would have embarrassed both of them. I know what I feel. I have felt these feelings before. I know the light and cheer that the man brings me, and I know the fear I feel when he is ill or when he goes to battle. I could only fake ignorance to my heart if I was to pretend. It is just odd, for not only is Lawrence a man, but there is Eliza, and to think of Eliza makes my soul sing. Am I a monster, Lafayette? Have I a defect? How can I give my heart so wholly to my family, to my unborn children, if I cannot deny that I love a man? I do not see any reason why you could not love two people at once. Or that you could love this man and also love your children to be with the same intensity and passion that you dedicate to all other things that you do. Why would loving someone else ruin your goals for your family if you are driven and dedicated? In the French court, and I am sure here, many marriages are arranged, and these relationships often continue successfully even if there is no love. So for there to be too much love should not be a fatal failing in and of itself. Certainly, if there is anyone with enough passion in his or her heart to love his family and then another man, that very man is sitting with me. Lafayette picked up an apple slice and popped it in his mouth, and then took a swig of the port. My first suspicion, if I may say, is likely that no one wishes to bring this fact to light as to avoid property disputes or make inheritance more complicated than it already is. Perhaps if another Lafayette had loved a man, he would not have become Marquis. Maria grinned. Perhaps, and then I would likely not be here able to help you read your own thoughts like the cipher to your nonsense. Alexander finished off the cheese, then reached for more apple slices. The crisp, bright flavor of it exploded on his tongue, and he savored the flavor in silence as he pondered the words. Is it so obvious? He asked. To me? Oui. Although my background is quite different from the average continental soldier. The Frenchman smiled. You look at him in this manner that reminds me of Adrian, and that is of course that he is your Lawrence, as you say, but perhaps I only see because I am blessed to be friend to you both. It is in the manner that you touch, it is the manner that you sit next to each other, it is in the manner that your head ends in his lap after you have drank too much, and if it is him who has drunk too much, you become his guardian, gathering him water and making sure he does not fail himself. He paused, considering for a moment. I do not know if there is one particular thing or one moment that I realize the depth of your care for him, but to me it is clear as day, and I am happy for you. Lafayette was giving him that look again. He knew it all of a sudden. Be careful, the look said. You need not look at me as if I am a stray child about to mouth off my deeper secrets to anyone besides my closest friend, Alexander said sharply. I acknowledge the seriousness of the issue and do not intend to disclose this information. I am well aware of the consequences should such a thing be known. Of course, I have little to lose, but if he... Um, there is no definition of the word stray child that does not apply to you, Hamilton. Do what is this nonsense of having nothing? Do you not have a wife? And a cause, and a marquis that would be grandly distraught to see you hang! Lafayette frowned. I suppose it is unfortunate I am not an estate, for that is what you clearly value! Alexander scowled. I am sure such things do not seem so important when one acquires them en masse, and they are accompanied by a place in the French court. The frown on the Frenchman's face became deeper, and he crossed his arms across his chest. 
When he spoke, there was a new low note of anger. You have asked for my confidence, which I have given, despite the seriousness of your confession. Nay, crime, which I will not share. You have asked for my counsel, which I have given. You have asked for my advice, which I have given. And now it appears you are striking me with jabs regarding my inhabitants. Out of any one, I would not expect you to think I would pick land over my mother and father. You are my close friend. I would trust you with my greatest struggles, but I will not tolerate to be so disrespected with this accusation. It is my fault of law. I was born into my family, and that for them all to pass is some great achievement on my behalf. I mean only to say that, yes, Lawrence has a family, and he has land, and those things may mean something, if that is what you care to value. But to make this suggestion you will pass unmourned, I would be forgotten as ludicrous. The very general of your army would seek to protect you if you were able. I know that you value nothing more than your legacy, Hamilton, but you do not speak for anyone else. The energy dropped out of Alexander's shoulders. I did not intend to put forth such an accusation. I was unnecessarily harsh with you, my friend. Your confidence, counsel, and advice are all grandly appreciated. And I am honored to know you would mourn my passing, even if it were as a punishment for such a crime. It is the fever talking. As I was saying then, Lafayette resumed, resettling himself into the chair. I will not be told I have misplaced my concern about this. You know of the punishments for exposing such a thing. It is marvelous that your heart is so close. But perhaps you should have a few less whiskeys on the upcoming events, so that you know how likely it is you may accidentally be pronouncing your new affections in addition to your usual rambles about the government. Mon dear, I already have heard enough about your affections to last me five lifetimes. I can control myself when I am drunk, the Frenchman snorted. Perhaps you should consult your comrades before asserting so. Alexander resettled his blankets around him and redirected his full disdain onto the meal. Lafayette cleared his throat and took a swig of port. Personally, of course, I do not think it is so unreasonable to love another man, if a bit unorthodox. Certainly there are stranger things that are done, no? In such a light, it would almost be natural for an unusual character as yourself to have this trait. Children of war show that love is not required for a family or for heirs. Perhaps God gave us love to show us how much joy we could bring to another, just as he gave us war to show how much pain we can cast upon our enemies. Alexander decided at that moment that, despite his use, perhaps Lafayette was as wizened as he pretended to be. Of course, this was not something he was ever going to share with the Frenchman. Thank you, mon ami. Uh, do you think that he... Baba yet dumped the remaining apple slices in Alexander's lap along with a small bottle of liquor. Then he collected the remaining bones and apple cores and wrapped them in a piece of paper and dumped them back into his rucksack. If I did not already think so, the anguish on his face upon seeing your body on my horse would have confirmed it. A beat. Now eat. You will need strength for the battle because not even God himself will be able to keep you from it. Alexander frowned. It will be soon. He stuffed another apple piece into his mouth. We are days away. Lafayette's brow furrowed and he looked away. Only the last few things must be managed, and then we will march at dusk. A battle in this bitter cold, and that will be snow. He was disturbed by a loud throat clearing outside the tent. Major General, a voice said. Lafayette looked at the tent flaps and shook his head. I must away, Hamilton. There is too much to be done. As your major general, I am ordering you to stay inside this tent. And if you do not, the general will be mad at your Lawrence, and so will I. A cruel blow. If cruel measures must be undertaken for you to rest, then they shall be. Lafayette stood and brushed himself off. I will see you when I am next available. Until then, be well, my friend. He bowed, then left. Alexander worked through the remaining apple slices, then set the port in his pack for some future celebration. Then, with a grunt, he moved himself and his blankets to his desk with a reasonable amount of effort. He could pick up a pen. He could dip it in the inkwell. When he looked at the paper, it did not slide out of focus, or at least not enough that he was forced to look away. He would be ready for battle. He had to be. He began to write.